Okay, we think we can start. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here to today's session on Sandboxes for Data Governance, Global Responsible Innovation. My name is Axel Klapake. I'm a Director for Economic and Social Development and Digitalization at GIZ headquarters, uh, based in Germany. Data, for sure, is one of the most strategic assets for both uh, economic growth and sustainable development. It can provide key insights to make better decisions around food security, climate change mitigation, or health policies. Hence, data can help policymakers and private organizations to better allocate resources, solve problems, and prepare for risks. And as the backbone of AI application, its potential for the achievement of the SDGs cannot be underestimated. But for the use of data to benefit all, data sovereignty and data security need to be strengthened. We need regulatory frameworks that help reap the benefits of data while protecting citizens. And I think that is the key assumption of this and the starting point of this session. This panel gathers experts uh, from around the world to discuss how regulatory sandboxes can unlock the value of data for all and promote responsible innovation in AI. I'm very delighted to welcome on this panel today uh, Deputy Minister of Transport and Communication, Agne Vajju Kivi Chiute. So I knew it would be very challenging and uh, I was trying to, to uh, pronounce it uh, a bit correctly. No, very uh, welcome, uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, from uh, Deputy Minister from uh, Lithuania, and she focuses, among others, on innovation and open data, and she will share her uh, perspectives in a few minutes' time. We also welcome Dennis uh, Wong uh, as the Deputy Commissioner at the Personal Data Protection Commission of Singapore. She manages the formulation and implementation of policies relating to the protection of personal data. Uh, we also welcome I think she is joining, uh, joining virtually, is Kari Laumann, uh, he, uh, is the head of section for research analysis and policy and project manager for a regulatory sandbox for the Norwegian Data Protection Authority. She collaborated with stakeholders in the AI industry in Norway and is one of the team members ahead of AI regulations in her country. And then we also welcome Lorraine Pochienkula. Uh, she is here on the panel. She is the co-founder and executive Executive Director of the Data Sphere Initiative, uh, an international nonprofit foundation with a mission to responsible unlock the value of data for all. She is an affiliate at Harvard Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. And last but not least, we have Olalade Shilon. She's also here on the panel. She's the head of private privacy policy across Africa, the Middle East, and Turkey for Meta. She is a human rights lawyer who has focused on privacy, access to information, and freedom of expression. Our panel this afternoon will be moderated by our friend Armando Guillaume, who is an affiliate at Berkman Klein Center for the Internet and Society and doctoral candidate at the Technical University of Munich, focusing on social sciences and technology. And finally, we also welcome our online moderator, Hello, Pascal, Pascal König, a GIZ colleague. He is a planning officer at the uh, GIZ headquarters. Uh, he has served as the John F. Kennedy Memorial Fellow at the Minda de Gunsburg Center for European Studies, and he's also a postdoctoral researcher at TU Technical University Kaiserslautern. Together, they will discuss now the roles of regulatory sandboxes in the promotion of responsible data governance and AI innovation. Secondly, a regional perspective on the enablers and challenges of implementing those sandboxes. And thirdly, uh, the issue of international collaboration on those regulatory sandboxes. As GIZ, we are very, very happy to facilitate this discussion and to support this session. Regulatory sandboxes can be really a great tool to promote regulation for a free, uh, fair, free and open data economy. In this way, the potential of data and AI can be used to achieve the SDGs. They can facilitate medical service delivery, increase efficiency in agriculture, and improve food security. Thank you very much, and uh, please enjoy this wonderful session. And now, over to you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Axel, for your kind introductions. And it's a real pleasure to be here in such a uh, distinguished uh, panel with these uh, experts on the area of uh, regulatory sandboxes, which are gaining a lot of attention, a lot of traction now. Uh, there is a lot of fuss about regulatory sandboxes be becoming more important uh, nowadays to deal with many of the regulatory questions there are regarding AI, data, many other technologies and innovations, and of course, that will have an impact on technology. And here, uh, perhaps briefly, just as an introductory remark, I would like to provide this context on regulatory sandboxes. It's uh, not a comprehensive one in, in the way in which basically we have, and that's one of the biggest challenges we have right now, a lot of definitions of what a regulatory sandbox is, how they work, how they're being implemented, and these kind of questions that we're going to have, uh, be uh, answering today, perhaps are, are opening uh, the floor for these kind of discussions to take place. So, if we are going to start, and that's one of the basic elements that we have to be, have very much in mind, is that regulatory sandboxes are having a lot of definitions, and there are many different ways on defining what a regulatory sandbox can be. You can see laboratory sam uh, regulatory sandboxes, sorry, that look like laboratory innovation labs or that look like many other projects which are not necessarily uh, re even related with, with regulation. Some others are related with, with, with regulatory questions but are dealing with them in a very different way. So here just to take an approach of what the UN Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development defined as a sandbox is that a sandbox is a regulatory approach, not, not even a space, but an approach typically summarized in writing and published that allows life time-bound testing of innovations under our regulator's oversight. That's our definition, yeah? And that's perhaps a definition that some share, some will say not necessarily. There is, I don't see that it has to be a regulatory approach. Perhaps it's a regulatory experimentation space or an ecosystem of experimentation. That's one of the challenges that we are facing uh, right now and that authorities around the world are facing when they are approaching to this kind of tool to deal with innovative regulatory measures. From there, we have uh, this big question of how have authorities designed and implemented regulatory sandboxes around the world, and that's a very interesting thing to, to analyze, and uh, I had been able to look into this in some of my, of my previous work. So I have seen sandboxes that had been developed mainly by two people in, within an authority working on learning more about a technology, they, and this is called a sandbox. In some other countries, a, a whole sandbox unit is prepared for developing these kind of projects and developing and deploying an adequate sandbox, and we will hear from experiences from all around uh, the world. We have the uh, sandboxes also, and this is something interesting, of course, we're going to talk more on the data sandboxes, but we have seen sandboxes, of course, developing on the fintech sector. On the generative AI, of course, there's all more, all more attention on why sandboxes can be beneficial to understand many of the challenges posed by generative AI systems, and of course on the GovTech and public sector. So we ha have seen these areas and these areas of work as areas that can be of interest for many uh, stakeholders that are, have been working on this. The fintech sector, of course, has been one of the leading sectors on developing regulatory sandboxes around the world. And that has been perhaps one of the uh, biggest uh, promoters of having sandboxes. Other authorities are trying to follow the, the same path. Now, on many questions about IP, data protection, antitrust, and many other topics. We have seen, for example, in Latin America, sandboxes being developed. For example, in Brazil, now we have this public announcement, and we will hear from the uh, colleagues from the uh, uh, Brazilian Data Protection Authority. They're going to tell us a little bit more of the, this new generative AI sandbox and data protection that is going to be developed. At the same time, Colombia, that has this fintech regulatory sandbox, which has been also quite big, and a privacy by design and by default sandbox being developed there. We have also uh, sandboxes all around the globe in Ethiopia, for example, we have seen a sandbox unit being developed there, which is going to be a big unit within the Central Bank of Ethiopia that is going to create some kind of regulatory experimentation environment. Germany, of course, also promoting many of the sandboxes, all, uh, almost all of them at a regional level, and of course, with this sandbox handbook that was developed some years ago, which has been quite influential, not only in Germany, but in many other countries. 
At the same time, we have seen sandboxes in, in Kenya, so the Capital Markets Authority, they're working on a very interesting fintech uh, sandbox, which has also been quite important to develop the fintech ecosystem in the, in the country. And Lithuania, of course, with the GovTech regulatory sandbox and the, the sandbox for the public sector that we will hear more from the vice ministry. So that's perhaps the whole representation that we want to have here. And many of, of the experts that are here have been very much involved into these kind of projects, have been working on them. So we have also, for example, the experience of Norway and Singapore working on data protection sandboxes. Uh, Singapore developing one of the first frameworks on, on on how to, to have a regulatory sandbox on data protection and on AI governance, which was also very interesting. And Norway trying to open the black box and trying to develop this idea of more transparency with a regulatory sandboxes, with a regulatory sandbox, sorry, in Norway for this specific purpose. So with this brief introduction and this brief context and definition of what a sandbox can be, it's that we are facing now this big question on the, on the relationship between regulatory sandboxes and internet governance. What's there? Why are we talking about regulatory sandboxes in this specific forum and when we are talking about technologies such as AI and when we are talking about the future of data and data protection? Basically, because we're having a lot of questions. For, so for example, three big topics such as privacy, protection, mis- and disinformation, and digital power concentration, which we definitely have to analyze. How are we going to analyze that, and the authorities are going to analyze that? That's the biggest question. What are the, the decisions and the regulatory decisions to be made? That's where sandboxes, perhaps, can be helpful to understand the real impact of these technologies and what can be achieved with the current regulatory frameworks that we have. But that's the question, perhaps. Are regulatory sandboxes the enough in, in order for authorities to develop capacities to deal with many of these big regulatory questions? What has been the experience of other countries that we have here and many other experts that have been working on different contexts that can help us to understand a little bit more about that? And that's perhaps all, one of the other big, big questions that, that we have. Are sandboxes for all authorities around the, the world? Are, are sandboxes effective in any country, or there have to be some initial capacities within some countries and some initial elements for these kind of projects to be developed. With the GIC, with the German cooperation, we had also been working on, on this, and with my colleague Pascal Koenig, also trying to answer some of these questions because we believe that sandboxes can be expensive. You can spend a lot of time working on, on them. Are they effective? Are they going to be effective to answer many of these internet governance, and many other questions about regulation of te technologies such as AI and the use of data and data cross-border data flows and many other big questions on the future of, of these technologies. That's what we would like to answer and discuss today. So with that, I would like to start briefly with a, a video of uh, the Data Protection Authority from Brazil that they were very generous to send to us this um, video They were very much uh, involved in the preparation of this event. Unfortunately, they were not able to join us, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's also good to hear from them, and then we will start with the questions with the experts here and the experts on the Zoom room. So I think we can start. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and distinguished guests, I stand before you today on behalf of the ANPD, the Brazilian Data Protection Authority, filled with immense gratitude and excitement as we co-organize this workshop in collaboration with our esteemed colleagues from the Berkman Klein Center and the Datasphere Initiative. It's a privilege to have the active engagement of representatives from various government bodies and networks. Together, we are embarking on a journey that is not only significant, but crucial for the future of data governance and AI innovation. Our primary goal in this session is to foster a dynamic discussion among all relevant stakeholders. We aim to deliberate on strategies that can pave the way for the development of sandbox initiatives. Initiatives that not only stimulate innovation, but do so while upholding the fundamental values of humanity. In this session, we'll delve into three key areas. First, 
we will explore the pivotal roles that regulatory sandbox play in promoting responsible data governance and fostering innovation in the realm of AI. Second, we will examine a regional perspective, shedding light on the enables and challenges faced in implementing these sandbox initiatives. Lastly, we will discuss the importance of international collaborations in shaping the future landscape of sandboxes. I am thrilled to announce a significant milestone in our journey towards responsible innovation, the launch of the call for contributions for the ANPD Regulatory Sandbox on AI and Data Protection. This initiative, crafted in collaboration with esteemed partners like CAF consultants, including the distinguished Armando Guillo, who is today's moderating this session, seeks to create a space where innovative ideas can flourish while ensuring the safeguarding of individual privacy and data protection. I invite our esteemed panelists and the entire audience to contribute actively to this endeavor. Your valuable insights can shape the very foundation of how we approach AI and data protection. You can submit your contributions via our webpage, which you can access via the QR code presented on this screen. I am delighted to inform you that submissions can be made in English, allowing for a broader and more inclusive dialogue. As we embark on this collective journey of exploration and innovation, let us remember the profound impact our discussions can have on the future. Let us collaborate, ideate, and inspire one another. Together, we can create a future where innovation and ethics coexist harmoniously, fostering progress that benefits all of humanity. With that, I wish you all a very productive session. May our discussions today be illuminating and may they pave the way for a future that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, so we have this invitation from the Data Protection Authority from Brazil, this very exciting sandbox. We can move then to uh, our first question, and perhaps here for our panelists and vice minister, I would like to start perhaps with your uh, approach to sandboxes and your experience on this work. Like for you, like what is your practice concerning sandboxes? What are the benefits of sandboxes that you have seen in your experience in Lithuania and the work you're developing right now? It will be very much interesting to hear um, how the sandboxes have been evolving in, 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 in your experience and what you have learned from that. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me here. Uh, I think sandbox is, is one of my passion. And uh, it's, while it's very important uh, to speak about the future of the Internet, uh, it's something uh, sometimes very important to um, speak on the practical matters, uh, how all those innovations we bring closer to us. So in Lithuania, you mentioned uh, one of the good practices is uh, GovTech sandboxes. Uh, these are a little bit more on my colleague's side, but this is already a world winning uh, way of looking into problem solving. It started in Lithuania in 2019. I think last year it got an award on European level of um, uh, sandboxes that helps, you know, for uh, public, uh, public uh, governance uh, to solve um, uh, issues uh, within the governance to make it more accessible to the customers. And uh, I just uh, figure out, I will maybe just tell you some of the examples. Uh, for example, uh, there are some examples based uh, AI solutions to measure the quality of digital government in an innovative way. Uh, Kodami solution to automate the detection of illegal gambling operations online. Burby solution to improve the environmental risk assessment of companies. Open assessment technology solution to perform remote examination for civil servants. And many, many solutions that are already um, um, used in, in Lithuania and the governance in one or another way. I think that platform was so successful that uh, from the government side, the investments into these kind of sandboxes grew. And now it became a huge part of the uh, innovation uh, ecosystem in Lithuania. But what I would like to talk a little bit more, which is more on um, communication side. Um, 
countries these days invest a lot into infrastructure, uh, especially infrastructure for 5G technologies, and we are doing the same. Uh, in Lithuania, we do have the coverage of 90% of the population, almost the same as here in Japan. Uh, but when we want to see the value cycle, so to see the demand side, uh, we do not see enough of technologies there. So I think that's where the need of Sandbox is coming from. So what we did in this sense, uh, we dedicated more than 24, uh, 4 million euros for um, applications and solutions based on 5G. And it concerning not only um, uh, innovations uh, in transport sector, but in any sector. So uh, we are very happy of this possibility to do it um, a bit in a niche way. So it's not coming from the whole innovation policy within Lithuania, but it comes, the initiative comes from the Ministry of Transport and Communication. So we really want to see what the 5G technology is capable of. Um, and there is a lot, a lot of interest from business side, where we just uh, uh, called the tender. So just imagine maybe 53 projects are in the pipeline. Uh, more than 124 million euros uh, worth of projects of testing. Um, uh, testing and uh, within the sandbox regime and in Lithuania, those new technologies and applications. I think why it was so interesting for the companies because we created um, uh, the sandbox uh, in the manner that um, that technology and the result of the innovation uh, will belong to uh, the owners. Uh, the only wish from the government side is that the application, the testing side would be uh, you know, in Lithuania. And the idea um, is that um, uh, we want, uh, as a policy makers, to be able to be very flexible and dynamic and respond to, to all the innovations and uh, changes needed in the regulation framework. And I think this is uh, not only to create more applications on 5G technology-based solutions and to solve uh, some of the problems uh, uh, in Lithuania, as it is more of the um, exercise for the government as well to uh, adapt uh, in, on the re regulation matter as well. So we, uh, we are very, very excited uh, on uh, this sandbox regime because we do believe that now we kind of fill the whole value chain. So we're not only creating the infrastructure, but we're encouraging private sector uh, as well as, uh, you know, um, public companies to participate and create um, applications uh, in autonomous driving, in healthcare, in all other industries. And we'll see what's going to happen. I'm uh, very happy and hope that uh, at the mid of next year, we will see some very great, uh, great results and we will be able to share uh, about it. So maybe it is uh, for, for first intervention, that's it. And later on, we can continue. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Minister. Very interesting to hear many of, of, of those, some of those points, especially on the flexibility, attracting the private sector, presenting the results of a sandbox, which seems to be sometimes an easy task, but it, it is not as easy as we can imagine. And from there, that I would like to join to perhaps one of the sandboxes I had been studying the most, and that basically I had been working with governments, especially in Latin America, and they always say, look at the sandbox in Singapore. What are they doing in Singapore? And how the Singaporean sandbox is working? How do they were able to achieve these results? And, and from that, Denise, I we would like to hear from you because your experience, of course, in sandboxes has been pivotal for sandboxes to become a reference around the world. I would like to hear, and we would like to hear perhaps uh, some elements on, on that experience and how do you think, especially at data protection sandbox has been helpful, helpful to achieve this balance between being responsible, being also flexible, but at the same time, like unlocking the value of data, which is also very important for many of these future conversations that we're having. So the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks, thanks for having me. Um, as you said, Singapore has 
experimented in sandbox sandboxes for, for quite some time. Um, it's been a very useful tool for us uh, in policy experimentation and also in experimentation of frontier technologies generally. We tend to use it as a policy mechanism where there are uncertainties in application um, as well as use cases. Um, and it's very much a tool that we use in partnership with industry where we need clarity on certain technologies or solutions surrounding different types of use cases. Uh, we also look at it uh, where organizations need support uh, for compliance um, and also to understand the integrity of their business use cases um, and their intended sort of uh, business commercial pathways forward. Um, I wear two hats, both as the Data Protection Deputy Commissioner, but also as the Assistant Chief Executive of IMDA. And in that role, I also look at data pr promotion and, and growth. Um, and those are, to us, two sides of the same coin. Um, and so we view sandboxes as a crucial tool to support industry, uh, but to also help them to find appropriate safeguards, guardrails, and protections uh, for the end user. We've had a, a few sandboxes for a while now. Um, we specifically had a data regulatory sandbox that eventually grew to become the privacy enhancing technology sandbox. Um, and that's been something that's been running for about a year now. Uh, we've just closed the, the first stage of it. Uh, and I would just like to highlight sort of pockets of benefits um, that we saw. Uh, there were certainly benefits to individuals because it gives them assurance and confidence um, that data is not being misused. Um, it helps with transparency and to flesh out sort of questions of ethical use. Um, we find that with sandboxing, experimenting in a safe environment cuts down time and efforts for technologies to be deployed. Um, we also see benefits to the organizations that participate in our sandboxes because they can safely experiment with cutting ex cutting edge technologies that um, give them a competitive advantage. And of course, I mean, realistically, that's what companies are trying to do. Uh, we find that organizations very often come to us uh, to provide regulatory support and guidance. Um, they want to understand the potential of technology solutions, but they also want to comply with what the regulator wants. Um, and it, I think, Interestingly, we also find, and this is talked about a little bit less, it also creates opportunities for B2B data collaborations. Uh, very often, companies come with their own use case. They may not necessarily understand the ecosystem the way we see it from a more central point of view. And a lot of what we do in sandboxes is also putting together different parties within that ecosystem, matching them to technology providers or to end users or to intermediaries. Uh, that allows um, that sort of ecosystem to be created in a specific sort of sector or specific use case. That's not to say we don't benefit at all. Uh, we benefit a lot because it helps us as regulator understand about technology, understand about industry needs, um, and it allows us as a f to focus on areas that could potentially require regulatory guidance. But I did just want to clarify that we don't necessarily think that sandboxing must lead to regulatory guidance. For us, it's just one of a broad range of policy loop, the levers and tools that we have. Uh, we do as a modality, I don't know whether I'm jumping forward a little bit, but do tend to publish use cases um, and re reports at the end of each sort of experiment. Um, and that in itself, sometimes it just ends there, but it gives the sort of sector and people who are interested a sense of uh, what were the regulatory issues, what were the obligations and allocations of responsibility that arose out of us working through that use case. I would just say that as regulator, we do get our hands quite dirty. Um, we do spend a lot of time working through the mechanics of each individual use case um, to try and understand what the concerns are, what the issues are. We bring other regulators on board where there are, where there are issues that don't fall within our, our sort of purview. Um, so it is quite an intensive process for us. Thank you. Thank you. And it's very amazing uh, experience and, of course, elements that, that you shared there. And f f with that, I think, so, Lorraine, we, we have heard about this case. I don't know if we can already call it a, a successful case of a sandbox being applied to data protection. Uh, we have seen some of the elements that have been used also in Lithuania for, for the development of the sandbox for, in Singapore. In your experience, you had work uh, from the Datasphere Initiative, uh, working with different governments, working on reports on how to build these kind of, of projects. 
what do you think governments should do? What, what are like that checklist of elements to develop sandboxes that have the capacities, that have the impact that we would like to see on such projects that have a lot of work to do, a lot of uh, resources to be used. We want to be effective on, on those. What do you see are the best practices, perhaps? Thank you so much for the question. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here in this panel because sandboxes is also a passion of mine. And so seeing one workshop that we get to discuss this in the IGF is uh, it's just a pleasure. Um, so on the question on the skill, I think that there isn't a particular set of skills or a skill that is needed for you to, to deploy a sandbox. Uh, I think there are as many skills as there are sandboxes and there are many, as many sandboxes as there are use cases because no sandbox is going to be the same uh, depending on the, the national jurisdiction where it's located, what's the institutional framework, what are the core partners that we need to be involved, what is the issue they are trying to solve, what's the time frame, and the complexity of all of this is just... Uh, it, it's just, uh, it just makes it exponential, the number of different uh, um, skills that you need to have and the people you need to bring uh, um, in the house. And I think that's sort of an important step into demystifying what sandboxes are. And, and that's uh, sort of the campaign that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lead uh, from my own corner uh, in the Data Street Initiative. Uh, we have a, a report that we published uh, last year called Sandboxes for, uh, for Data Building uh, Agile uh, Spaces uh, Across Border to uh, addressing that issue. And in that report, we try to look into the good practices. And I consume a lot of the, the reports that are coming out of, uh, of experiences, such as the, the one from the C Singaporean uh, uh, government. Um, but also in terms of what other actors are doing different, in different countries uh, and trying to be systematic about understanding what has worked and what hasn't. Uh, we're still at the early stages of understanding how that can be deployed to other use cases, right? But there is a maturity in terms of trying to understand uh, one, what are sandboxes, and we can all agree that it's an umbrella term that captures a whole lot of things, right? Uh, and I think depending on who you ask what sandboxes are, they're going to have a different kind of definition. Uh, and that's okay, and we should be okay uh, with it uh, as well in terms of seeing it as, as an anchor for a policy prototyping for experimentation. Um, and, and the second aspect that we're looking to also is in terms of the potential of using this uh, in internationally, which I'm going to come to uh, uh, later uh, in the panel. Um, and what I, I realized is that having done that study and that analysis of the, of the experiences internationally and then talking to a number of governments, there's still a, a lot of uh, people are still very much afraid of what it means in terms of resources and skills that are necessary because they're under the impression that's something that you need to be a very sophisticated regulator uh, in order to be able to deploy. And I think the first step is trying to uh, exactly say that actually it should be simpler. It should be about looking at a different way in before you design policy and regulation in terms of engaging stakeholders rather than doing something where it w it's sufficient for you just to post a consultation online and then forget about it. Um, how do you actually engage stakeholders from the design phase onwards? Uh, and how do you build that trust, that institutional trust with the private sector and civil society and technical community uh, and government and, and regulators in order to like come together and, as Denise said, get their hands dirty? And that's not something that uh, a lot of institutions are prepared to do or have the frameworks that allow them to do it. So for me, it's, it's, it's less about the skills in itself, but rather than being allowed to do that, to actually engage purposefully with, with stakeholders. And, uh, and this is a, an important part of the capacity building that we are doing now, and we are, uh, with the support of the Hewlett Foundation, uh, uh, now started a project in Africa uh, and through uh, Africa Sandboxes Forum, where we're bringing together stakeholders to create that community of practice in terms of sharing uh, what can be done uh, and what are the issues that you would like to solve uh, from a multi-stakeholder uh, iterative fashion. And doing that in terms of, uh, um, we, we have a course which we designed that takes you through in terms of what sandboxes are and their potential. So that's an important part into sort of building that skill in terms of 
words and vocabulary that we are using in the space, but also in terms of how do we turn this into practice. So rather than just being a talk shop where we're talking to them about sandboxes and what it should be, we are actually, uh, in the best way uh, of a sandbox, bringing them together in terms of uh, can we identify an issue that we can address and can we do so in a way that uh, helps with uh, issues that are, are relevant among different countries at the same time with different stakeholders through dedicated sandboxes that we are piloting and we'll be simulating uh, until next year onward. And I think that is a step in terms of just being able to define uh, uh, what are the appropriate stakeholders that need to be involved depending on the, uh, on the use cases, what are the, 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 uh, the, the technologies that might be necessary if you're looking to operational sandboxes and to B2B uh, um, transfer data, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned. But also in terms of what are the arrangements in terms of mitigating risks that may, may emerge, uh, what are the different kind of uh, 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 ways for you to look into measuring and monitoring uh, and evaluating uh, the success of that sandbox as well. And so we are in a process where we are, uh, and I like to say, and I'm not joking, but it's sandboxing sandboxes really in terms of uh, how they can best, best function. And I would like to see a space where we are able to share more of, more of those good practices so that we can reduce the cost of actually implementing those sandboxes in sharing uh, 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 resources among each other. Thank you, Lorraine. And I really like this idea of, of exactly, of sharing. And this, we, we definitely should talk a little bit more later on the, on the global forum for sandboxes and sharing these kind of ideas and having these kind of forums for th this interaction. We have uh, two colleagues, actually three colleagues uh, that are on the Zoom connection and I think it's, they're in Af Africa, Europe and we would like to very much say good morning to, to, to them, I think. Uh, so I will start with the Kari Lauman in, uh, it, from the Data Protection uh, Authority in Norway. It's Kari there, yep. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah, hi, Kerry. So, so nice to see you. And uh, well, it's it, we have been hearing of all these experiences, Kerry. And uh, of, of course, we needed to have also the approach from, from one of the first authorities that develop a data protection sandbox dealing with the black box uh, question about AI. Uh, we will really much like to hear from, from your experience there in Norway and what you can share uh, with us. And of course, like, what do you think were the benefits and have been the benefits for Norway of having this sandbox and at the same time, especially, and perhaps Kari, if you can make a little bit of emphasis on the entrepreneurs and digital entrepreneurs in the country that had been involved into these kind of projects, that would be amazing. So Kari, the floor is yours and thank you for, for being here. Thank you and good morning from Oslo. I wish I could be in uh, Ethiopia with you, but uh, I'm calling in from Oslo. Yeah, so we started our sandbox in 2020. And if I can pick up on uh, Lorraine's um, suggestions to share good factors. Um, one of the good experiences we had in building a sandbox was that before we kind of opened the sandbox for application, we did a speech to uh, Norwegian companies and we asked them, what are you going to need? Can you hear me okay, by the way? Is the sound okay? Not so good? No, 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 it's better, I think, yeah. Better? Um, okay, can you just give me a sign if the sound is bad and I can try to change? It's, it's not the, the, the best. I don't know if we will have to continue, but, but what we are able to have the... Is it better now? Sorry? I tried to change the mic. Pascal, can you uh, hear me? Yeah, but we have the closed captions here and we can, perhaps that, that's helpful. So you, you can continue like this and we will follow you with the closed caption. No worries. Okay. Yep, yep. Um, let me just try one for us. <laughs> So you will change. Okay. Yes, please, Kerry, continue. No worries. Is it is it better now? Maybe. 
Yes, it, I think it's improving. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so we started our sandbox in 2020, and uh, the focus for our sandbox is data protection and artificial intelligence. And before we open the sandbox, we asked Norwegian companies, what are you wondering about when it comes to AI and data protection? So this is two years after the general data protection uh, regulation in Europe came into force, the GDPR. And the Norwegian company said, okay, we have the regulation and requirements, and we're starting to use AI, and we have some guidance, but we're wondering how will this work in practice? So specifically they asked, okay, we have to show transparency, but how, how do we do that in practice? Do we need to open the black box? There's a requirement about fairness, how does a fair algorithm look like in practice? And also there's a requirement on data minimization. How do we do that when AI needs a lot of data? So for us, we got to work with Norwegian companies, real cases where we tried to help them solve these uh, quite interesting cases. And also at this point, we didn't have a lot of legal uh, precedence in Europe about applying the GDPR to data protection authorities. So the sandbox has been a great opportunity for us to dig into issues that we see coming in the future. And I think it's been valuable for the participants uh, in the sandbox. That's the feedback that they got, give us. And we work with public, uh, private companies, uh, small startups, but also big, uh, big uh, corporations in Norway. And the feedback we get from them is that it's useful because it's very uh, hands-on. You, you need to get your hands dirty, as um, Denise said. You have to really dig into the issues. So it's quite resource intensive for us to run this sandbox because we really go deep in each individual case. Uh, and for us, it's also been very important to be transparent about the process and the findings. So for each project, we have an exit report where we share what do we do, what discussions did we have, and what were the conclusions. So the idea for us is by helping one, we help many. So it's important for us to choose companies and projects that have questions that a lot of other companies are also wondering about. Thank you, Kerry. No, the, the, the sound improved perfectly. And that last point on presenting the results, it's very much important, I think, for the future of sandboxes and many of the sandboxes we have seen. There are a lot of sandboxes now, but how many reports and results we have like two, three big examples of how results are being presented, and that's why I think this experience in Norway has been also very interesting. And we have heard of governments, authorities working on this. Uh, now it will be also interesting to, of course, to, to, and it's a pleasure uh, uh, to have you, Olade, that we can also have your approach from a private co company, a private sector, like, how do you see the sandbox experiences? What's interesting for, for, for you? What, what calls your attention when you hear about a new sandbox in X or Y country? What's th that point in which you say, this is interesting to hear more about, this is a sandbox in which I would like to participate. So, uh, all that is a pleasure to have you here and we would like to hear th your perspective on, on, um, on that point. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. It's equally a pleasure to, to join you. Um, in this very, very interesting um, conversation so far. Um, so, of course, um, uh, for the private sector, the, you know, um, benefit will depend really on the type of sandbox, you know, we're looking at in terms of the unique context and um, specifics of, of each sandbox. But generally, we believe, you know, uh, at Meta that sandboxes are very, very important um, and they help in so many ways to, for example, reduce regulatory uncertainty, um, to offer, of course, a safe space for innovation, uh, which, which is very important. And sometimes it also helps companies to be able to, you know, adapt quickly and be more competitive. Um, 
I think the other part is also being able to build trust. I think someone alluded to that uh, earlier. To build trust between the regulator and, and, and the private sector as well is also an important benefit. So at Meta, um, we have mainly engaged with sandboxes from the, from the position of facilitator. So a couple of years ago, we developed a program called Open Loop, um, which essentially is, we call it a global experimental governance program. Um, and we try to essentially bridge the gap between tech and policy, and, and policy innovation. And so we try and foster collaboration between you know, those who are building emerging technologies, different startups uh, and different companies, and those regulating them. So basically regulators in the field. Um, and we partner with a whole range of stakeholders. So it's a very multi-stakeholder um, process with governments, tech companies, academics and civil society as well around different issues. And we, we do two things. So one, the one bit is regulatory sandboxes. Um, but we also do policy prototyping as well to ensure that we are looking at, um, we're trying to support better regulation in the, in the ecosystem. And so we've done a lot of this um, globally. Um, I will say except in Africa and the Middle East. And if we have time, I can come to why that has been an issue. I think some of the challenges have been alluded to, to earlier. But well, we've done a lot, you know, for example, we did uh, you know, sandboxes in, in Uruguay and Mexico around privacy enhancing technologies. Um, we've done in India on human-centric AI. Um, we did a couple um, based on the EU AI Act which sort of threw up a lot of things that you know, I would like to sort of share about what we think are the most important, shall I say, conditions or um, factors to take into account in having a successful, um, successful sandbox experience. So I'll run through them very quickly. So one, of course, is having very clear focus and goals um, because there's so much, especially now with the conversation uh, around AI, there's so much that, or there's the, I think there's also a possibility of, of, of people wanting to do much um, and really that's not you know, necessarily uh, possible. So having a clear and focused um, goal is, is very, very important. Another key thing that came out of our EOA Act experimentation here was having generalized results. So make sure that whatever one comes up with is something that can be applied, not just for those who are in that particular sandbox, but would be beneficial for those you know, um, in the ecosystem, generally speaking. Um, other things around having clear limited timelines. I think there've been conversations around you know, sandbox is taking a lot of time, which is sometimes why a lot of folks are hesitant to engage, especially regulators. So having very clear and, and defined timelines, um, having clear responsibilities and rules for participants, you know, also ensuring that there's technical expertise. Of course, this doesn't mean that it has to be like, you know, 100% level expertise as, as Lorraine mentioned, but at least being able to articulate what the key issues are and being able to walk through them. Um, also selecting, um, the participants we use an objective criteria so that they're actually able to have you know a good representation across the board otherwise it becomes you know um it becomes problematic in terms of you know uh sort of sharing the outcomes because then it becomes an issue of you know we didn't have a good spread of, of, of participants in the in the in the sandbox and of course i think collaboration is very important you know fostering collaboration between not just the companies and the regulators but also amongst companies and of course, if possible, if it's a cross, you know, uh, cross-border one amongst regulators as well. And I think what I want to flag lastly is the benefits of participants. There has to be an obvious benefit to those who are, you know, participating in, a, in any kind of sandbox. Otherwise, one might struggle to get high-quality um, members interested and, and, and participating. And of course, there are a whole range of ways to, to make this happen. You know, um, ensuring that they actually have access to guidance of the regulators. You know. Um, also, sometimes having you know access to the facilities to experiment could be uh, what pulls them in. Um, in some cases, also you know um, certification. So sometimes when you go through a sandbox, you get some kind of certification that shows you have been able to engage and you know acquire some kind of skills. That's also something that supports you know um, participation. So so th that's in a nutshell some of the things that we we think help in terms of having like a you know good outcome in terms of sandboxes um, across the board. Um, and just to flag, like I said earlier, that there's been challenges with getting this going in the region. The only data related, so we have one or two fintech um, related sandboxes in Africa, um, as well as in the Middle East, but the only data related one so far started a couple of months ago in Saudi Arabia, still at very early stages. So there's not much to sort of share about, you know, the lessons that were learned um, in that regard. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lana. We wanted to also 
finish this first round with your remarks, which I think are very interesting because that idea of building trust among different stakeholders, uh, it's always a, a big challenge and how, and I think it has a lot to do with the design of many of the sandboxes and the participation spaces that there are. And talking about the also participation, we would like to open the floor for this first round on questions that you have. I, th I think you can stand up he over here to the microphones and p please, if you could present briefly yourselves, give your, your name and your questions, we will be more than happy to hear you. So, Good morning, yeah. my name is Claudio Agosti, I'm a platform auditor, and uh, uh, mostly my question is for the um, uh, expert from Singapore and from Finland. Um, I'm concerned because uh, soon the AI Act uh, will be in place uh, so there will exist a national authority. This national authority needs to, to run a national sandbox. So the question is, uh, in average, for a use case, how many uh, days per person is necessary to study it and to create the test base? Because it seems that uh, it is the potential bottleneck to uh, handle a lot of cases. Um, I think you're right. We don't handle a lot of cases. So to us, the sandbox is not a tool for volume. It's not uh, meant to, it's not like a framework or policy where you set, you know, at, at the general principle level or even at obligation level, and then it applies to thousands or hundreds of thousands of cases. In a year, maybe we work on six to 10 cases where we are really just working through what the use case is. Um, I think one of the things we find helps a lot is to set very clear use case objectives. So if it's fairly tight in scope, the parties already know what you, they want to do. It's really about just uh, working through the accountabilities. Um, then it is more straightforward, easier to do. If it's about helping companies to find players, technology players, um, they know they need, they have a data problem, they want to use a privacy enhancing technology, they don't know which one, um, that it becomes a longer process, a more involved process, and it can take many months to sort through. Um, so I would say, uh, unfortunately, the way we do it, at least, it's fairly customized to the use case, and it can take usually an uh, average of maybe three to six months to work through a use case, sometimes even longer than that. Um, but of course, we have other policy innovation tools, such as policy clinics, which, where we're just giving quick advice on, how, on, on accountabilities. That one can be much faster. Thank you. I have also an additional small remark, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. This is A.A. Sambos Rahman, come from Bangladesh IGF. Uh, thank you, panel. Thank you, moderator and uh, honorable minister. Uh, we learned so many things regarding the sandbox from this session. Uh, I learned from your presentation, Mr. Moderator. Uh, CNET has uh, developed uh, one sandbox regarding the misinformation. So how can uh, we utilize uh, this sandbox regarding the misinformation mm. from the civil society side, apart from the government. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a, a, a big question. I think that we're having sandboxes on misinformation. Definitely what we would like to analyze is to gather some good evidence on how these technologies are actually spreading misinformation and what kind of measures can, can be used. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest questions that we have right now, like what are the kind of measures that can be used and how to implement some of those. And that's where sandboxes become <laughs> so attractive because you have this kind of flexible space in which basically you can interact with some companies and basically try to make them uh, get involved into these kind of questions, concerns. Let's work together. Let's involve civil society that has been doing some great work on this area. And let's try to show you like basically what could be the measures there. To, to put into place. I don't know if the sandbox in misinformation is actually a sandbox on, on a flex, providing flexibility. I think it's more on providing build, uh, trust building efforts and perhaps this multi-stakeholder approach, but that's, that's, that's what, how, how I see it. I think there's interest in many countries to start with this kind of work even before regulating, because of course there's a lot of regulatory pressure also. <clears throat> Why don't we regulate these kind of practices? Sandboxes are seen perhaps as a first step before going into that. So that's, that's how I think we, we, are, we will see some sandboxes and misinformation more and more, in, in, I think, in the, in the near future. So, so here, thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bertrand de La Chapelle. I'm with the Data Sphere Initiative. I just want to make uh, a quick comment. Uh, the word umbrella term has been has been used, and I think it's uh, an illustration of the fact that the sandbox is also uh, sandbox approach is a spirit of experimentation, and there is a growing toolkit or tool set for governments to experiment various approaches depending on the topics you mentioned, the clinics and so on. And the consequence is that it is particularly adapted to the early stages of any policy development or policy interrogation, which is the agenda setting and the issue framing, which is a, a stage that is usually skipped because the moment people have identified a problem, they run to say, my solution is A, my solution is B, instead of taking enough time early on to frame the problem as a problem that people have in common rather than a problem that they have with each other. And so thinking about sandboxing as sometimes an early tool to identify how to shape the problem before you get into drafting whatever guidelines, regulation, or just code of conduct is probably an important element in the sandbox approach. Thank you. I don't know if there are any reactions to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, please. Um, my name is Christian Ramska from the OECD, and I have a question related to one of the risks or potential risks of sandboxes. Um, given the, the very, very nature, the number of firms that can participate in the, in the sandbox are obviously limited. So the question is, how can we make sure that there are um, no distortion of competition going on um, that is favoring those companies participating, and also how can we avoid um, regulatory capture? given exactly that closer interaction between the regulator and the companies. And so in general term, how can we make the, um, the sandbox more fair and non-discriminatory? Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for a great uh, question. Uh, and you know very well, having worked in, uh, in, in written about uh, uh, sandboxes and, uh, and all the risks that we actually need to balance, and that's one of them, right, in terms of, of competition and regulatory capture. And I, I think that's part of the process of trying to ensure that you're building trust with a broad spectrum of stakeholders. And what's interesting about sandboxes is that it does allow the regulator usually the flexibility to go beyond the traditionally regulated entities. That, that's been the case around fintech, right? And so for those of you who know uh, the, the experience around fintech, uh, I mean, it's a very regulated sector, right? Central banks have banks that they regulate, in, and that's, I mean, financial institutions, and that's a very tightly knit group. Here, with the experience with FinTech uh, 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 sandboxes, what happened is that they did open calls for different startups and companies to come in and provide different services and innovative services to, uh, to uh, answer to a, to a demand or to a problem. And here there were telecom companies that came in, startups, a whole bunch of innovators. And the solutions that came through those uh, uh, fintech uh, uh, regulatory sandboxes has been really, uh, really impressive in terms of um, providing, in the case of Brazil, for example, uh, instantaneous payment system that in, right now four out of five, five, uh, five adults use. So it's the fastest growing instantaneous uh, payment system in the world, it's called PIX. Uh, faster growing than the ones in India and China, surprisingly. And it was the, 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 concert, the concerted effort that went beyond the, the traditional companies, the traditionally regulated companies. So in terms of spirit, uh, it, it is something that it's, uh, it's, it's meant to be more encompassing than a, what a traditionally regulated sector looks like. Uh, of course, there are always risks, always risks that that's not going to be the case, that we're going to uh, choose our champions and just invite the ones that we know best. But I think being um, uh, cognizant of that risk is, is a, a first step in, uh, in terms of trying to mitigate it particularly so that are, there isn't a regulatory capture, which is always a concern when we're looking to healthy regulatory frameworks. How do you build the governance of the spaces? So um, having more conversations in terms of good practices uh, and also on the frameworks that we need to, that need to sort of set up uh, at least the minimum condition for regulatory sandboxes, uh, I think is the first step to go to, uh, to, to mitigate those risks and, and anticipate them. 
And if I may just very shortly to add uh, from Lithuanian perspective, what we've done uh, so far, so uh, as, a, as, a, as a, an obligation to participate in Sandbox and get the financing for any testing purposes, uh, or there should be a group of stakeholders involved. So it's obligatory to involve higher education institutions, uh, someone you know from civil society. Some, so there is a range of compositions that is uh, a, an obligation uh, to be a part of. So we don't want you, I mean, I clearly understand uh, the, the threat there. Uh, we don't want to see you know, one side of um, sandboxes and solutions. Therefore, the broader uh, stakeholders group has to be involved. And I think that we clearly um, put it into the uh, rules of participation uh, just to avoid uh, uh, this obstacle. Thank you. Uh, and we have to perhaps uh, provide space for one more question. Yes, and it, of course at the end I will we will have the space, please. I'm so sorry about that, and because we have also the online moderator and everything. So, yeah, thank you. So thank you. Uh, sandboxes, in my experience, actually uh, break away the concentration that takes place usually in, in, in smaller, you know, like financial sector. I, I was on a committee uh, as, a, as a tech lawyer for the Middle East of a Pakistan's central bank. We did a exactly right a innovation challenge fund, so there was money as well as the ability to have your uh, idea you know, sandboxed and, and approved. Um, and what we noticed was that basically, by going through that process, we got you know, startups, et cetera. Nobody was interested in the money as much as they were interested in the approvals. And then the, the, the most amazing thing was that it had a multiplier effect. It, and I'll speak about that in a second, but the more important thing was that it started having conversations between regulators saying you're not the only ones, you need to actually get approval from another regulator. So the conversations broadened, that was helpful to, for the ecosystem. And uh, as a result of these things that happened, the central bank was, was confused about things like, should we allow cloud in the financial sector? Should we do core treasury systems on cloud? And electronic money issuers and digital banks were enabled because of this exercise. So that was very, very helpful. But I have a question. My question was, what I just mentioned regarding the uh, learnings between regulators, have you found that that has been something that you've also experienced that, you know, there's one regulator maybe is doing financial services and there's other regulatory approvals that are required and how do you interact and coordinate that effort when you do a sandbox? I'd love to know. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a great question. Uh, we, we do work, I would say more domestically, um, because as, as IMDA, we hold the horizontal sort of uh, regulations for data protection. Um, but obviously, in a use case, of, of, of often they are sectoral and, and vertical. So for example, where we have a finance use case and a finance uh, regulatory question comes up, we will bring in um, the monetary authority, for example, to sort of work out joint guidance. Um, if it's a healthcare one, then we'll bring in the relevant um, regulator. Because very often from the business's point or the industry's point of view, there are regulatory questions. They don't really care which regulator is going to answer the question, or they realize that it crosses different silos. Um, so that's also been a fairly sort of interesting uh, way to solve problems. Um, and it's, it's quite been quite a helpful exercise, not always the easiest, but um, I think quite important uh, to move things forward. If I may just very shortly, Chad, uh, it's a very interesting topic. We could talk about it uh, hours and hours. Um, once again, in the Lithuanian case, uh, where we were focusing mostly, was not, uh, you know, was there technologies or ideas uh, uh, which would be at the very high um, T real. Um, so we are not talking about sandboxes where the ideas are like uh, tested or tried on the very, you know, um, not mature sense. We are talking, you know, because the, the money is quite huge. We're talking about the last TRLs that would be later on be scaled on. So it's a bit, you know, it, it's really sometimes important to speak on what side of the sandboxes and the ideas maturity we're talking at. 
Thank you, and thank you for all the questions, and ho hopefully we have some final minutes for those questions that are, that are left and many others. Uh, I will give the floor then to the online moderator, to Pascal Koenig, this, I think, from the GI seat. Uh, Pascal, the floor is, is yours. I know you have also some interesting questions and the challenge of making this in 30 minutes or less. So the floor is yours, and, 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 and thank you for, for also joining. I know it's early morning for you. Yeah, thank you, Armando. It's my pleasure to join you online and to now direct you and uh, guide you through the next set of questions. And I would like to shift the attention a bit and pick up on something that especially Lorraine has already commented upon, and that is uh, I want to adopt a bit more of a regional perspective and look at aspects of international collaboration and cooperation. Um, so my first question is, I'm interested in how important is it to learn from other experiences when implementing and operating a sandbox. And perhaps more specifically, you can also say something about how transferable are sandboxes from one context to another? How much, how much work has to go into adapting them when you transfer them? And since I'm uh, online, I would like to direct the first question to Kari. Yes. Um, so. I think we were one of the first data protection sandboxes in Europe, but there was one before us, and that was the ICO, the British Data Protection Authority. So when we were starting our sandbox, we did reach out to them, and they were very generous in sharing their experiences and do even documents. So we learned so much from them. Of course, we had to adapt uh, we didn't just implement because there are cultural differences. There are so many differences. So we did adapt it, but that was super useful. And I think also the spirit of sharing we have kind of carried with us. And we've had so many different countries in Europe and beyond reaching out to us because we're one of the first sandboxes. So we have also tried to share all that we can from what we have learned and what we have built. And I think it's been really useful since the sandbox concept is, is kind of new and a little bit fussy for a lot of people. So I think, you know, sharing their experiences that are there is very important. And I also agree with what has been said uh, earlier in this panel that there is not like one definition of sandbox. You can make it your own and make it fit your own purpose. So I think, you know, uh, sharing is important, but also you know, listening to the needs uh, of the target group that you're trying to reach is, is very important and, and tailor it to your own purposes. Yeah, thanks very much for these, for these insights. And um, for the panelists in, in presence, I will also direct the question at you, also perhaps at, uh, at Denise, um, since your sandbox has been uh, an inspiration to, to, to others, as we've heard before, um, what's your perspective on the importance of sharing, um, learning from experiences and the transferability of sandboxes? Um, it, no, it's a great question. I, I think so far, I would have said, honestly, a lot of it has been domestic focus. There isn't um, an APEC or an ASEAN framework um, in, in the areas that we operate in. A lot of it was about helping industry. And we do work with industry players who, who operate all over the world. So there is an international element. Um, but I think more and more, as we have tech conversations like these, as we meet more and more interested regulators, as the interest in sandboxes grows as a regulatory tool, I think there is a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, and uh, a lot that we can learn from the use cases that we all, all um, sort of get our hands dirty on it and do. Um, so very supportive of the sort of broader sort of conversations and, and principles that we can we can uh, all buy into. And I think absolutely a lot of these questions about data protection or misinformation or AI are transferable just by the very nature of the theme. Um, and so we have a lot that we can learn from each other. Hey, thank you very much. Um, yeah, would go maybe one step further and also ask about um, in what ways can international collaboration and exchange on the regulatory sandboxes uh, be most helpful for regulators, um, for authorities? Um, what do you think are important areas for, uh, for collaborating? Which areas are especially important uh, currently to advancement? Um, 
And um, since Lorraine has already said a bit about the importance of exchange and collaboration, I would direct the question to you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, and and I think it's important to, to consider that while sandboxes uh, have been deployed nationally, there's so much, much potential, not only for sharing those uh, experiences internationally, but also on co-constructing and building those uh, internationally from a, a cross-border perspective. In the report that I mentioned uh, that we published last year, uh, we list a number of different areas where they could be tested. Uh, so, for example, in testing privacy-enhancing technologies, which was already mentioned here, but from a cross-border perspective, by looking as, uh, as well through uh, issues like um, new uh, data intermediaries as well that are emerging. So, um, think about the role of data fiduciaries or, um, for example, uh, data commons, data collaboratives that may exist in one country and may want to be certified or recognized in another jurisdiction. So how do we do that? How do we create that space that actually allows for this exchange of what are the minimal requirements? How do you actually get uh, that transferred across border as well? But so we can think through sort of technologies and issues that are uh, more transversal that are emerging uh, within uh, the digital space, but also within more vertical sectors uh, in terms of uh, how cross-border sandboxes could be used, uh, for example, to address uh, issues that are already included within trade agreements. Actually, DEPA, which is a, a trade agreement, uh, one of the, the new uh, trade agreements, uh, digital economy partnership that uh, Singapore is actually a signatory to, together with, uh, with New Zealand and Chile, with Canada also uh, acceding to it, um, includes already a provision uh, on uh, the potential of, of having uh, a data uh, sandbox within the within DEPA. Now, no one knows how to do that uh, uh, right now, but it's already included as a provision. And I, I, I see that, uh, I mean, this new generation of trade agreements may as well include beyond the lengthy process that it takes to negotiate and balance multiple interests into a static text, that it actually creates the forum for us to test what are the issues that businesses and society and regulators will within those different uh, countries care about, care about enough to work together to solve a solution, right? So it's very much around uh, how do we get, uh, how do we operationalize a lot of those issues that uh, we spend a lot of time, a lot of time negotiating uh, under uh, closed doors. And so trade agreements for me, it's an issue uh, and it's one that we include in the report. The other one is around health. Uh, so think about the issues around transferring uh, sensitive data uh, uh, across border, but also on the opportunities of using that for research and innovation, particularly in the moment of pandemics, right? Uh, but also on the complexity of balancing, balancing those objectives uh, of innovation and research and public health uh, with uh, issues around data protection and other regu regulatory systems that uh, somehow uh, uh, interact with, with health objectives. Um, about the issue of climate change, which is the most transversal challenge that we have uh, uh, in our planet. How are we going to actually get through working uh, on solutions if we don't have the space to collaborate together, right? And uh, what for me is very encouraging uh, is that uh, we can use this as uh, as a blueprint to think about international cooperation in a different way. So I I have a career having worked in different international organizations at the ITU at the OECD uh, uh, before uh, I, I co-founded the Data Sphere Initiative, and with and for me we need to think about not ways to supplant uh, uh, multilateral processes, but at least to 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 collaborate with them and create a space where we think about solutions and we are concrete about it, right? And so for me, that's where it lives, the opportunity for cross-border sandboxes, for us to create that space where we are between just do nothing and regulate and forget, we have we find this sweet spot, so it's sort of the, the, the Goldilocks spots where we can actually uh, work test um, solutions. Yeah, thank you so much for these interesting comments. Certainly important, important issues, and I have several GSET colleagues who are also very interested in this, this question of cross, enabling cross-border data, data flows. So that's certainly something to continue the discussion on. 
And I would also uh, like to invite a, a private sector perspective on the question of international collaboration and those areas that are especially important. Uh, Olonat, would you also say a bit on that perhaps? Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascal. Um, I fully agree with, with what Lorraine has said. Um, excuse me. I think, you know, um, by their very nature, sandboxes are, they require stakeholder collaboration. And there's a lot of things that can be learned across the board if, you know, um, if, if, if they're given a chance. So, so definitely broadening, broadening this kind of collaboration across borders um, will definitely enrich the learnings um, and help policymakers definitely, you know, better understand the ecosystem and be able to, to you know, um, figure out the kind of policies and rules that would apply in different contexts and in different environments. And this, in a way, would help with harmonization. So for us at Meta, we believe in having a harmonized approach to regulation and policy making. And so, in a way, whilst we know that different countries will have different rules and different, you know, um, laws or legal systems, but there's a lot to be learned in terms of working together and collaborating on these kind of approaches. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, we all, um, I mean, globally, there are a lot of treaties that exist, even though each country has their own, like, you know, domestic legal systems. So in the same kind, you know, working together across, you know, across borders with, with, with the regulatory sandboxes and, um, and the like, for us, it's very, very important to ensure that, you know, there is this widespread collaboration across the board and consensus. Of course, things, there's cultural nuances, there's, you know, specific nuances, but at the end of the day, at a high level, there are basic principles that apply across board and that one can learn from, from, from experimenting and, and collaborating in this, in this space. Yeah, thank you also. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe going a bit, a bit further in that direction, um, what are your observations regarding the, the, the need, but also uh, how likely it is that there's an increasing harmonization of sandboxes both beyond the national level, either through uh, new sandboxes that are being created on the regional level, or perhaps through a stronger harmonization of existing sandboxes? So, uh... <clears throat> Likelihood um, is a very tough question uh, because I think it's a complex issue. There's a lot of factors that that come into play in this regard. Like I mentioned, differences in legal systems, but like zeroing in on the region that I cover, which is Africa and the Middle East, there is a lot of um, challenges that I think that exist with sandboxes that are probably more acute in the region. So things around, you know, the time it takes for this to be executed, um, things around the cost that it involves. And the reality is that we have I mean, data protection, if you're talking about data governance related kind of initiatives or sandboxes, it's fairly nascent in the region. And so most of the regulators are literally trying to figure out exactly how to build the infrastructure, like build you know, um, uh, their, their, their organizations. And at the same time, there's a lot of impatience from ordinary people with them being able to enforce and being able to you know show that they're actually relevant in the ecosystem and so you find many of them trying to say okay how do we um prioritize you know being legitimate and being able to do what we need to what we are established to do um in that case if we have to prioritize that we don't have enough resources financial or technical to be able to focus on sandboxes which take too much time for us to be able to see any benefit so that's is i think one of the challenges that we're seeing in the region but we're hopeful um, that, you know, with organizations such as Rain working on this issue in the, in the region, we can see some, some push and some movement um, towards having sandboxes because there's no doubt that they are very important for, you know, ensuring innovation in the, in the ecosystem um, in the region. Okay, hey, great, thanks. And maybe to get um, a perspective also on a different uh, region um, and to get a bit uh, on insights on the perspective from Lithuania, um, Lachne, what is your um, perspective on the need for harmonization on a regional level and how likely is this to be? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for the question. I think that uh, there was uh, already a lot of good things said. I think that if we talk in the short-term perspective, harmonization, uh, maybe it's not the way to go. Maybe I would use better word, collaboration. Uh, across borders. That's what I would expect more happening in a short period. I think that um, 
harmonization is always better for those uh, who are not first movers, uh, for countries like Singapore or others uh, who has a lot of experience already there and uh, openly shares it with other countries. This is uh, something that uh, um, would be maybe not um, uh, so interesting in a short perspective. I think that um, we are talking about, you know, innovations at this point. Yeah? So uh, innovations are uh, very important, uh, you know, not only to have a safe space to test it, but also, you know, to have a freedom uh, to explore the potential there. I think what uh, our experience is in this field, we also were not uh, unique in the sense of with our sandboxes, and uh, I'm proud uh, to say that uh, we got the experience, of course, from UK. Uh, we had a very uh, close co collaboration, so we went there, we invited them, we had a huge conference on the sandboxes just to share their experience, because there was a lot of things which they said that we should not do. <laughs> So it was also very valuable for us. Uh, so I think that the harmonization, uh, maybe um, it's too early uh, to have this question at this point. I think now, today, we're talking a lot about what is the concept of sandboxes, what kind of sandboxes we do have. Then we have some, some just you know, good initiatives already. So uh, I think uh, what we really need, we, we, we need to catch up with the scale on sandboxes in so many different levels and just to show maybe for other, you know, uh, policy uh, makers, uh, how valuable it is. Uh, I'm convinced already, but, uh, uh, but that's uh, not, not enough. I think if we want to make uh, huge changes uh, within the governments, uh, we need to, to think uh, um, further. So during this panel, uh, I got so many ideas uh, how fast we need to go to Singapore with our minister. Uh, and so on. So I'm joking, of course, uh, but thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, no, thank you, Deputy uh, Minister. Pascal, yeah. Yeah, I have, I have more questions and I would love to, to hear more from you, but I think um, uh, by, by keeping an, an eye on the clock, uh, I think we should leave some, some time for, some, for another round of questions from the audience. And uh, I can see um, questions online, but of course I cannot see them in the room. So Amanda, you can... Uh, Gladly, uh, go ahead. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, I will start with a question here in person, and I would like to get the questions in the Zoom room because I don't have them. I don't know if you can help with that, but please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for the very insightful panel. I'm Claudio Lucena, Paraiba State University Law School in Brazil, and I'm also the co-coordinator of the Open Loop Experience uh, in Brazil. Uh, we are addressing privacy-enhancing technologies. Uh, I'd just like to add a bit on Lorraine's comment about the happiness of, of having sandboxes discussed in a privileged space like this. For years, we have talked about uh, the necessity to regulate in a more adequate, dynamic, flexible, scalable way. And bringing sandboxes to this privileged space means that we consider it one of the op uh, of tools to operationalize that spark regulating. Yes, for the digital space, but definitely not only to it. So my question is a little bit more mundane, though. Uh, it's a question about time frame, uh, and I'd like to have these experiences here of Lithuania, maybe Norway, and, and Singapore. You, you have a framework to operationalize a sandbox, and there is a space where you weigh back in as a regulator to say if and which measures are going to be taken out of the experience you, 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 you have. How strict, the question is how strict you intend to be or have been in these measures, do you wait until the whole process is finalized as, as the regular uh, framework uh, 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 foresaw, or are you ready to intervene in a point where something stands out as very important not to be uh, waited for? Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know, uh, Carrie, if you want to start there? Yes, I think this is a very good question and very relevant for us as regulators. Uh, I think for Meta, it's a bit different if you're a private actor and you have a sandbox. But as a regulator, our kind of uh, powers are very strictly regulated in the GDPR. So we are to case handle, we are to you know do enforcement action, and we are to give guidance. And for the sandbox, for us, this is a guidance uh, tool. So we call it a dialogue based guidance. So for us, it's very important to be clear that this is not a decision 
we uh, only give guidance in the sandbox and then the company who is participating can um, decide themselves for what they will actually do. And also, we are very clear that we don't give any exemptions from the regulation. So even if they're in the sandbox, the regulations still apply. Uh, so our sandbox is more about exploring those area in the regulation where there might be questions or uncertainty of how it should be implemented in practice. It's not about giving exemptions or giving like a stamp of approval. Uh, it's basically guidance. So I think that's uh, uh, an important uh, kind of um, also, it's important to be clear about what the sandbox is and, and clearly define that for anyone who, who participates or wants to, to take part in it. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I would say that for us, it's a fairly sort of dynamic process um, because we get, we read in right from the start of the of the use case. Very often, right from the get go, we're trying to understand what is the regulatory issue they're trying to solve for, um, and uh, well, at the end of the process, we come up with the case study or, or, or with the published report. So obviously, there is that that process. But I think throughout in the engagements, we are working on the ground with them to work out what are the regulatory issues, where are the interjurisdictional issues, where are the interdisciplinary issues, um, and, and we are going back and forth um, on that process all the time throughout. So I, it's definitely in the realm of guidance. Um, I, for us, it is a fairly agile and dynamic process, uh, and I agree completely with what you said earlier in your speech, which is really, it's about agile policy making. So it's very much in that space for us. Um, and uh, we don't really sort of see this as, okay, you go figure it out and then we'll give you an answer at the end of it. It doesn't really work like that. So thank you very much. Very good question. I think our perspective is um, a bit from different angles just because we're, I'm not from the regulatory kind of authority. I'm from the policymakers uh, kind of side. This the, was initiated from our side. So we understand sandboxes as a part of uh, work, working very closer with the ones who are, uh, you know, testing all those innovations. And uh, once again, obviously, it's a very dynamic process. Nobody wants to implement or change any rules that is, uh, you know, absurd or whatever. But uh, the idea was um, to kind of open it and uh, be dynamic in regulation as well because we have some of the regulations already in place, but there are no usage cases. So it means that it's written on the paper, but then the reality does not work. So that's what we are having. So our perspective with Sandbox is try to kind of close this gap. And obviously we understand that nothing could be taken you know, for granted or fully you know, within the process because we did not even touch up on the fact that uh, while do, doing those sandboxes, there could be uh, some not uh, usable cases in the future. You're just testing some, there could be some failures as well. So we are look, looking into this more in a relaxed manner, uh, just to see what, what's gonna happen, just you know, to create a play, uh, playground for, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, but Mr. this has been a, an amazing panel very much on a topic that is still on the making. I think there are many things coming on, uh, on the way. A global forum on sandboxes, Lorraine, perhaps. We have, of course, uh, uh, that will be, will be coming and, and projects on, on different sites, Lithuania working on this, Norway still continue to do the, the good work. Although I think Meta is going to be also very important actor on many of these conversations and as a participant of the Sandbox Singapore, continue the great work. So this has been already amazing. Also with the GIC working on this uh, assessment on Sandboxes and how to help countries to be more efficient on implementation of Sandboxes, something that we're working with Pascal. So. This has been already an, 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 an amazing experience. Hope that you continue the, the great work. Hope that you continue with all the great questions. Uh, and thank you again for joining. And this has been an, an amazing experience. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.